Deep Worker 7, this is top side. Deep Worker 7, good copy. Please proceed to bottom. Over. Roger that. Deep Worker 7, approaching bottom. You're in the largest canyon in the world and no one's ever been there before. There's so little known about this area that we're gonna see species that we didn't know existed. Everything we're finding here, it's new. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. We're headed to Pribilof Canyon and then Zemchug Canyon. Zemchug Canyon is the largest underwater canyon in the world. And it's also the location of a great deal of walleye pollock fishing, the largest single species fishery in the world. They're incredibly productive canyons. Yet despite all that, we know so little about these canyons. Um, so what we're really doing out here is true exploration. This is actually pretty remote ground out here, kind of like on the edge, as we like to call it. The Bering Sea is not a friendly place most of the year. The weather up here is just ferocious, and we really needed this beautiful summer weather uh, to give ourselves a chance to work the submarines and the ROV. No one has ever taken manned submersibles down into these canyons, so it's pretty exciting to be able to pilot a, a submarine down to 1,500 feet, um, knowing that anything that you see, you'll see it for the first time. For this expedition, we brought the smallest deep diving manned submersible that has ever been built. We're really using equipment which is quite cutting edge. They're uh, one mad submersibles capable of diving down to 2,000 feet. The deep workers are equipped with uh, an HD camera system and each sub is fitted with a five function manipulator. Basically a mechanical arm that can be controlled by the pilot and they can use that to uh, collect samples from the seabed. For the depths that we're exploring in these canyons that are greater than 2,000 feet, we have on board uh, a remotely operated vehicle or ROV. It can dive as deep as 1,000 meters. I don't think there has been any project which has even attempted what we're doing, let alone any project that has been successful. Very little work done out here and certainly nobody has seen the sea floor personally with submarines. Without looking you never know what's there. Roger that uh, deep worker seven, good copy, good copy. I have studied marine biology my entire life and thought I had some understanding of Alaskan marine ecosystems. But dropping into this portion of Zemchug and Pribilof Canyon was, was amazing. It's absolutely incredible. I'm over 100 feet. I've got a school of dolls porpoise diving down from the surface to play with me. It's 
absolutely fantastic. We really don't know uh, the value of these canyons or the uniqueness of these canyons, and that's certainly what this mission is about. Well, the focus of this research and the impetus for this research is to examine seafloor habitats that have yet to be explored. We have some indication that there are coral and sponge habitats in these regions, but no direct evidence from direct observation. Well, this is the first major step in getting some information to understand the importance of these canyons. My depth is 1,737 feet. Coral and sponges in many areas uh, provide truly the only structure that's on the seafloor. We know that they're important habitat for many of the species that we harvest and, and many of the other species in the ecosystem, whether we harvest them or not. And we've found a few corals that we didn't know were here, and we've also uh, seen quite a few more sponges than I think anybody anticipated. We're looking at a large barrel sponge that just came back from about 850 feet. Attached to it is a beautiful basket star. There are many species living within the main chamber of this sponge. Uh, the sponge has completely grown over a sea fan, and it's forming these strange tubes. I've never seen that in this species. I haven't species. seen a fluted tube like that either. Not in this Absolutely species. Absolutely gorgeous. I've seen some fairly unique habitats, and I think the bigger question is what role might these habitats that we've seen play in the larger ecosystem of the Bering Sea? It's exceedingly clear to me after spending time on the seafloor face to face with juvenile fishes that they are relying quite intimately on some of these biotic habitat features. Our only good description of an area is, unfortunately, what we bring up in fishing nets. A lot of times, though, fishing gear brings up specimens that are unidentifiable because you only bring up pieces of them. On this trip, we're actually collecting them, so for the first time, we'll be able to document exactly who's down there. Wow. We found uh, some corals and sponges, some that we expected to find here. Uh, based on what little information we have, and, and there's also been a couple of surprises. What's that one? This is bamboo. That's primnoa. Yeah. Yeah, this was a very productive dive because we collected three of the, really the big corals we wanted to collect, the red tree corals, the black corals, and the bamboo corals, which are probably three of the most important corals in Alaska. We know that they're important habitat for, for many of the species that we harvest. And aside from their value as uh, fisheries habitat, uh, we found out that many corals and sponges have other values to humankind. For example, uh, we're able to get information out of some of these animals that can tell us the past history, maybe on the order of centuries, of, of what's been going on in the climate. There's a couple of sponges that were found in the Aleutian Islands that that show a, a fair amount of promise as biomedicines. There are extraordinarily unusual life forms living there. Many, many things that they haven't even identified. The scientists haven't been able to even identify what's down there or name it. And it's being wiped out. It's like blowing up Mars before we even get there, is what bottom trawling is like. The nets get dragged along the bottom and things like corals and sponges get ground up and destroyed. The damage from trawling is really obvious when we're down there in the subs. You can actually see the tracks. 
You can see for hundreds of meters at a time, one broken coral after another. Once you destroy these communities, particularly at, at those great depths where there is no light, it could take hundreds, even thousands of years to regenerate. They're that sensitive and that vulnerable. The other problem is just the enormous amount of fish that's being taken out of the ocean, just the scale of it. And that's actually having a ripple effect up the food chain. So all the species, whether it's fur seals or seabirds or stellar sea lions that feed on some of these fish are, are starting to go hungry. Under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, all regional councils, including the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, are required to take an assessment of habitats in the regions for which they're responsible. Greenpeace brought the notion of protecting these rich canyon areas to the council many years ago and provided an extensive uh, background document supporting the recommendation that these canyons be protected. At the North Pacific Fishery Management Council we have entertained proposals calling for protection of these canyons and yet the council has always stopped short of taking action with regard to protecting the seafloor habitat simply because we have uh, very little data. Getting down there with the submersibles and, and getting video footage of this stuff has really told us that this area is richer than I think we really thought it was. Greenpeace will be able to use this research and the images from this expedition to help increase the understanding of how important these canyons are and also how fragile they are, how vulnerable they are to factory fishing, to bottom trawling, to destructive fishing practices. We're going to take this information to the policymakers at the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and to Congress if necessary. These canyons and the species that are thriving there are absolutely essential for the health of the entire Bering Sea ecosystem. I think if we don't afford these habitats some protection from fishing, we're going to see continued declines in species we harvest, which includes marine mammals for some people. We're going to continue to see declines in some of our target commercial catches as well. They are diverse, rare habitats that are of crucial importance to the whole ecosystem. If fishing activities move out into the uh, canyons, which tends to be the trend worldwide, and certainly we've found some fairly rich coral and sponge communities that, if not protected, I think certainly could be at risk in the future. I think that we've got some good information to be able to uh, look and make some good recommendations for management. Today there are no protections whatsoever for the highly productive areas along the Bering Sea shelf break. It's time to set aside these vulnerable canyon habitats as no-take marine reserves.